Good afternoon, Facebook, District 73 and beyond. My name is Kim McCarthy. I am the Democratic candidate for State Representative District 73 here in Ohio. And I'm coming to you live from my front porch as I do every Friday as a way to help connect with voters, help you understand who I am, what I stand for, and really show you what kind of leader I would be for you in, um, in Columbus. So we discussed lots of different topics. And today we are going to be talking about um, the Beaver Creek income tax levy that's gonna be on the ballot in November. Last week, we had a PAC, Tax Busters PAC, that was speaking against the tax levy. Today, we're going to be having a representative from the Beaver Creek Fairer Funding Committee PAC. So this is a group in support of the tax levy. So want to bring both sides of the argument to you. Um, it's important that you are an informed voter. So hopefully getting this information out to you will help you become informed and make up your mind for yourself, which is the best way to go. So um, District 73, I forgot to mention, is Beaver Creek, Fairborn, Yellow Springs, and, Be and Bellbrook, as well as the townships that surround those cities. So yeah, before I bring um, Brian Jarvis, who's going to be the representative today, um, I'll just do a little campaign update. It's getting closer, things are hotting up. I mentioned last night to a group that it's definitely a different vibe than what it was in 2018, I guess because it's a presidential election um, and you know, a lot more people are paying attention. Um, for our local people, you know, a lot of our issues are really coming to a head. And our schools, especially here in Bellbrook, you know, are um, in financial straits and we have a levy on the ballot as well in November. And, um, you know, these local levies, there's a reason all these local levies are becoming more and more frequent and are putting more and more strain and having more trouble passing. Um, so I will talk about that in a minute, actually. That's a big part of what I run my campaign on is a fair tax system where everyone pays their fair share. Before I get into that, let's just talk about the campaign. Um, there's three things that uh, you are able to participate in with me if you are interested. We have weekly rallies on Saturday afternoons. So they're fun. We just stand on the side of the road with our Kim McCarthy signs and help tell people as they drive by and show them what we're about. So we're doing them at one o'clock in Bellbrook, two o'clock in Beaver Creek and three o'clock in Fairborn. So go to my Facebook page, look at the event and you'll see the exact locations for those. Then on Sunday afternoons at two, we're starting lit drops. That would be literature drops. Where's my little flyer, my little door hanger? We walk around and put these on certain doors in neighborhoods. So this Sunday, we're going to be in Fairborn. So look out for us, Fairborn. You see us walking the streets. Don't call the police on us. <laughs> we're here spreading good news. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is writing postcards. So we have postcards. Cindy does up these wonderful packets for you. In fact, let me show you this. There's one sitting here waiting for someone to come pick it up off my porch, but we have a pack like this. You get the stamps, you get the labels, and then you get the postcards. So it's easy, maybe spend an hour or so at your own leisure to fill those out, get them in the mail and help tell your neighbors about my campaign and um, why it would be beneficial to have me representing you in Columbus. So that's it on the update. Um, back to taxes. I know they're exciting things for people to talk about, right? I'm an accountant. I know I kind of get stuck in all this stuff, but um, I, I'll try to make it as simple as I can. So basically over the last 15 years, the Republican government in Ohio, who has had a majority slash super majority, basically the entire time, have instigated a whole lot of tax breaks to people, th these tax breaks have basically gone to the very wealthy and to corporations. And these tax cuts have created like a revenue deficit in our state so that we no longer have the necessary funds to function properly. 
to fund our state government agencies, to keep our cities strong, to keep our counties strong. They have eliminated what represents $6 billion a year in revenue. So that has impacted our local governments a lot. That has taken, oh, I was, I was going to have it there. It's too hard to find, but basically it's over a billion dollars that has been taken back in the last like 10 years from our local governments. So cities like Beaver Creek are operating on half the amount of revenue that they were. So that is why these um, income taxes come in, why our schools also are having repeated levies. They are also impacted by these, um, these ta revenue deficits that are being operated. Basically, the Republican Party has sold out our schools, our cities, our townships. We're talking libraries, parks, roads, all of the things that help create a strong community. It's investment in the people. These things have been sold out so that they can give a handful of their friends tax breaks, people who don't need them. We have been sold out and they have created an unfair system where the people at the top are paying half as much as the middle and working class people in Ohio. That does not make for a successful state. So that has to change. It's not good. That basically is the fundamental problem of so many of the issues we face, a lack of revenue. It's um, irresponsible to give away tax breaks to people who don't need them at the expense of our children's education for one. All right, that's the end of my tax rant for today. So let me bring in Brian Jarvis of the Beaver Creek Fair Funding Committee, who's gonna talk about the Beaver Creek earned income tax that is being put on the levy to make up for the deficit that was given away to a handful of people by the supermajority Republican Party in Columbus. So let me find the chat, um, the waiting room. Here we go. Admit and admit. Oh, you're sideways, Brian. Yeah, I see that. That's not going to. That's not going to do. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Brian Jarvis. How are you? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. All right, I'm just going to read a, a little intro on you. Um, and if you see two Brian's here, that's because one is going to be the screen share that he's going to do shortly that will share some information um, related to what he's speaking about. But basically, Brian is a member of the citizens group, the Beaver Creek Fairer Funding Committee PAC. Their purpose is to promote fairer and more equitable funding of Beaver Creek's public services in order to lower the tax burden on Beaver Creek's residents and businesses in a similar manner as 242 of 246 cities in Ohio already do. I know Bellbrook is one of those that no longer, that does not have an income tax either. And there's obviously just a couple more across the state. So Brian's an Air Force veteran, a retired defense contractor and served on the Beaver Creek City Council from 2009 through 2017, serving as the city's vice mayor from 2010 to 11 and the city's mayor from 14 to 15. And he currently serves on the board of directors of the Beaver Creek Chamber of Commerce and on the Green County Law Library Resources Board. You've been busy, Brian. <laughs> I try to keep busy. Yes, yes. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Okay, thanks for the intro. Uh, uh, this is a great opportunity to present this uh, presentation to the community. Uh, many of which are probably Beaver Creek residents. Um, it just has an impact beyond Beaver Creek uh, in a small nature, but as we get through this, you'll find out why. Uh, let me just jump right into it and, and get into uh, what brings us to this point. Um, okay. What issues in Beaver Creek have brought us here? Um, are you seeing the slides now? Yeah, let me just make sure when I took you out, it may have turned it off. Oh no, you should be able to do it, but I do not see it yet. You don't? Yeah. Let me try to do a, a share screen again. Let me go back to the Zoom and share screen and find the presentation. 
and bring it up. Uh, I think we're working now. There you go. There you go. A technology grand. Yeah. Are we good now? We're good. Okay, let me jump into it again then. Uh, what Beaver Creek issues have brought us here? Uh, of, of course, many residents and businesses say their property taxes from the city are way too high. Uh, but of, of course, uh, the community that doesn't want to pay much higher taxes for public services, nobody does, nobody likes taxes. Uh, Non-residents who work here, though, could be contributing their share for public services as, as 242 of 246 cities in Ohio and numerous villages um, already do. Uh, fourth issue is the city has reached a point on current property taxes where it can provide services, but it can't maintain aging infrastructure, provide additional quality of life amenities or address residents, other concerns. And just like Sisyphus here, trying to push that stone up the hill, um, this is a very, very challenging feat to balance. Um, background information um, for Beaver Creek city residents, these are the entities that levy property taxes. Uh, the school district, the city, and the city's portion, that's 16.94% in the lower left-hand corner. People think that the city taxes them like crazy. The city only levies 17% of their property taxes and does all it does just with that. Uh, the rest is county, township, joint vocational school, health district, and the Beaver Creek Township Park District. Now with that small amount that Beaver Creek City um, manages, that 17%, it provides all the police services we have, all the streets and roads, the parks, there's inside millage to, to, to pay for some basic things. And there's the maintenance facility on Orchard Lane that is uh, funded by a bond. Um, that is all that Beaver Creek City levies property taxes for. As to whether or not Beaver Creek City has high property tax rate, the, the city of Beaver Creek has the fourth highest city property tax rate of all cities in Montgomery and Greene counties. Um, that's what just the, that's what those cities operate on. Um, Beaver Creek community doesn't want to pay higher, much higher taxes. And in comparison, our neighbor Centerville levies only 2.35 mills of city property taxes but it operates on income taxes, much of which non-residents who use their services pay for. So Beaver Creek's residents pay over six times the city pr property tax rate on their residents than Centerville residents do. Th th this is an incredible thing that many people just don't understand. Um, non-residents who work here could share in the services. Uh, three fourths of the jobs in Beaver Creek are held by non-residents. They would be paying for this, helping to pay for this. They contribute to the wear and tear of the streets. Uh, they benefit from our police department providing its safety services. They make use of our parks and recreation. It would be great if they would contribute directly towards funding these services. It would help lower the property taxes on Beaver Creek City residents and businesses. As for the city being able to maintain infrastructure and provide these amenities, the city needs a lot more money to do this. Um, the city of Beaver Creek currently has a $200 million backlog of projects and deferred activities that it can't do, dealing with the roads and bridges, uh, bridge culverts, capital improvements, uh, deteriorating streets, roads, sidewalks, side paths. Uh, Beaver Creek City floods every single year on both its east and its west sides, um, has drainage problems, stormwater problems, and these things are not new. They've been going on for years and accumulating and as inflation causes prices to increase, costs more and more to fix. Uh, just this year alone, uh, the street and capital revenue has a shortfall of $1.76 million. Uh, just this year alone, the police department has a revenue shortfall of $1.3 million. And our parks and rec department, though there's only a shortfall of $15,000, that's after a quarter million transfer of general fund to support operations. So every major department in the city of Beaver Creek has a cash crunch. N no question about it. Um, and these can are the I things ask, that- Can I just yes. ask a question? So yes. what, what happens say in the police force, for example, if they're 1.3 million short, um, mm -hmm. they have to make that budget work? They have to cut yes. 1.3 million? Yes, so, so for instance, uh, the, the city of Beaver Creek currently has 
one police officer per thousand residents. They know they need to hire two or three more. They can't do that. Uh, they knew that their, their parking lot needs to be repaired and protected and, and things done with it. Um, they can't do that. And so all the capital projects uh, inside the police department, uh, when they bring in someone for questioning, they need a private room to interview them in. Um, they have to rearrange things right now. It's, it's just very inefficient. And, they, and, and these are things that need to be done, but can't be done. Um, street and capital is the same way, but, but yes, uh, right now, the, the city property taxes, uh, the uh, police department is using up 92% of the revenue. They have to either bring in large amounts of property taxes for the police, or per this proposal, have an income tax funded with non-residents who work here helping to fund it. So yes, there are things that simply will not be done and will add to that $200 million backlog. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, every year in Beaver Creek, on, on the west side of Beaver Creek, going down Grange Hall Road where I live, and on the east side of Beaver Creek, uh, going down near Factory Road, it, it floods crazy. Many of our streets look like what you see on the left and right bottom sides here. Um, there simply isn't enough money to do it. Uh, when residents ask the city, why didn't you finish that sidewalk? Uh, because there was no more money. Or why didn't you finish paving that road rather than just patchwork um, asphalting parts of it? There just wasn't enough money. Uh, this happens all the time, every year, and there needs to be an alternative revenue source, source to help fund those things. Um, the city now, due to prior decisions by the voters has to stay with property taxes. Um, we're, about, we're the only city in Bellbrook and Beaver Creek are the only two cities in the state of Ohio where their charter says the city council shall not be able to levy any income tax unless the voters vote for it. Uh, the state of Ohio allows city councils to enact up to a 1% income tax without a resident vote. Uh, Beaver Creek cannot do that. And so the city has already proposed its plan to um, levy income tax or property taxes. Uh, they had planned to go on the ballot this November with a renewal and increase, but we convinced them to put the income tax on instead. So everything on that chart got deferred a month, uh, got deferred half a year, but they plan to put on a new street operating levy, a one mil bond issue, a one and a half mil police levy, a one mil street levy, a one mil parks levy, and then repeat that cycle every three to five years for those operating levies. That is gonna be a huge financial impact for the city of Beaver Creek. It'll cost about 12 to $13 million of additional property tax dollars every year over what's being done right now. And then that repeat every three to five years, uh, there, there's no telling um, how much that's gonna cost. Um, more to address that backlog of projects. This will raise property taxes in Beaver Creek, the city's portion um, from 14.93 mills and additional 9.1 mills. And we on the committee believe that'll have devastating effect for the city of Beaver Creek, for businesses who won't wanna come here um, and, and just harm things for the overall community in Greene County. We think to be equitable and fair to Beaver Creek we have this 1% earned income tax. And the first thing it does is it doesn't renew that 3.4 mil city property tax, it expires it and saves every property owner $101 per 100,000 of home value. It avoids all those city proposed property tax increases, <clears throat> which saves residents an additional $318.50 per $100,000 valuation totaling almost $420, 420 per 100,000. The income tax will bring in so much revenue that the city won't need to put those levies on the ballot. And then that cycle repeats every three, five years. It'll avoid that also. Now this 1% earned income tax, as it is in the state of Ohio, um, across every city, it's a tax on earned income and on things like lottery and sweepstakes winnings. Um, Non-residents who work here, will pay that first 1% tax. And since most of them live in cities that already tax their incomes, those cities give those residents credit for what they pay for here. So for most non-residents, it won't change their paycheck at all. 
Uh, those who live in like, townships and places without income tax, yes, it will impact them. Um, none of our residents who are retirement income will pay higher because the state prohibits taxing retirement income, Social Security, annuities, pensions, 401ks, anything you'd get a 1099 R form or a Social Security retirement statement form can't be taxed at the local level. Military income won't be taxed. Um, unemployment won't be taxed. Uh, one lady asked me, why would you do this in this time of COVID and people losing their jobs and only on unemployment? Unemployment isn't taxable at the local level. And there's a whole list of tax exempt income that the state has listed on the in their statutes at those two revised code websites. Um, Beaver Creek residents who are already paying taxes somewhere will be granted credit for that and not owe Beaver Creek anymore. Employed residents not paying taxes elsewhere, yes, they would pay 1%. So Beaver Creek residents who work in Beaver Creek on base or in a township would pay the 1% income tax, but it'd be offset by those property tax savings listed at the top of the page here. Um, so that lowers the net effective tax rate for all those people. So none of them would be paying the full 1% effective tax rate, essentially. Um, for this share, fairly share services between residents and non-residents, it fairly balances services between property taxes and income taxes, and it generates the revenue the city needs to maintain its operations and start addressing that backlog of projects. So this levels the playing field with all surrounding cities. Beaver Creek will be the 203rd, one of the last ones of 246 to have an income tax. The other three are bedroom communities, the city of Bellbrook, the city of Jackson, and the city of Cortland. They all have populations under 7,500. Beaver Creek's at 48,000 and with the infrastructure to show it. This stabilizes the city's revenue sources, provides the, the funding needed to address the growing needs, and not just of our community, of surrounding communities. Uh, right now, for instance, on the southern edge of Beaver Creek in Sugar Creek Township near uh, Swigert and Darst, there's a new development going in. Um, those people more than likely would be traversing Darst Road up to Indian Ripple to get to 675 to go to the base or to work in Beaver Creek. The current funding method, Sugar Creek Township's already said that they're not going to help pay for widening that road. They've already said so. That's all going to fall on Beaver Creek City property owners, but they're not the ones causing the growth needs. Um, this would eliminate the need for future property tax increases because over time, as business grows and they hire new employees who then broaden the tax base, they would be paying the additional taxes. And it keeps locally generated tax dollars in Beaver Creek where they occur. I mentioned businesses a moment ago. Uh, no, that 1% tax rate will be the lowest, except for Waynes, Waynesville and Jamestown, will be the lowest in this region. Um, no other city, there are some villages with that low tax rate, but no other city here has a rate that low. Um, this keeps Beaver Creek competitive with everybody else. Captures a lot of revenue from my residents working here, residents paying 1% or higher, of any of those communities wouldn't pay any more income tax. And it would increase funding for police streets, parks and facilities and help address the city's backlog. This is what will happen from a God's eye view to the community of Beaver Creek. Currently, Beaver Creek residents pay 100% of, of the cost, non-residents pay nothing. Under this system, the resident share will fall to 66%, the non-resident share from zero to 33%. Tremendous savings for the Beaver Creek community, and taxes that they can use to spend in restaurants or whatever they want to do with that. Um, it, it's a huge change. Property taxes, current property taxes, will still fund police, will still fund streets reduced by that 3.4 mil expiration, will still fund, fund parks. This new revenue source, earnings taxes, will, will supplement those, but then help complete that backlog of projects and through that list, you'll see those are all things that should have been done under the street police and parks budgets in the first place. The, uh, there's more ADA and EPA mandates, but again, they all come from things that should have been done, but there wasn't enough property tax revenue to do. Facilities, you need to rehab your buildings, um, construction of police statement and combined with the city hall, our buildings are old now 
that someone needs to administer the tax. Uh, the city itself doesn't have the space nor the capability to do that. There needs to be some other um, agency to do that for us. So in, in summary, comparing these two options, the current property options method, which the city is mandated to do, given the residents in the past have voted that, renews that 3.4 mil levy, adds one mil additional, and then over the next two and a half years, adds all those levies onto the ballot, and then repeats that cycle every three to five years. Twelve and a half million dollars a year additional property taxes out of residents and businesses' pockets, the highest city property tax rate in Montgomery and Greene counties. The alternative that we're proposing, 1% income tax on earnings, sweepstakes, and, and net profits from businesses, credit for income taxes paid elsewhere, tax exempt sources not taxed, it expires that 3.4 mil levy. None of those additional levies the city has proposed. Total savings per 100,000 of home value is $420 per 100,000. Uh, the income taxes that residents will be paying that haven't paid before would be mostly offset by those property tax savings and the in property taxes wouldn't be repeated every three to five years going forward. Non-residents would pay their share 1% and that is what would help fund this. Um, always looking for help. These type efforts are a lot of other labor intensive, a whole lot of manpower out there. Um, feel free to ask any questions. If anyone has put any in the chat or however, Kim, however you do that, um, feel free. Yeah, I'd have to flip over to Facebook to have a look. But um, oh. so I have a question. So yes. um, how much revenue is it expected to generate in a year? Yes. Uh, the first year, it would be expected to generate $12.5 million. Now, there's a caveat to that. The Regional Income Tax Agency, they're the major agency in the state of Ohio that administers taxes for over 300 municipalities, has told us that the first year of an income tax to only expect 80% of that. Um, there, there is a delay in collection sometimes. So, so some collections wouldn't take part until January of next year, of the, of the following year. Um, some residents might choose to um, file quarterly estimated taxes. And so the city wouldn't get those until early in, in 2023. Again, uh, this is being voted on in November of this year. It wouldn't be effective until January 1st, 2022, which would give time for that 3.4 mil levy to expire. And, and so 80% of 12.5 million is $10 million. And so the first year, the city expects to bring in $10 million. Uh, the second year, it'll bring in 90% of expectations. And we're told the third year from then on to expect full collection. So as that goes on, and as businesses start to come back and grow their workforces, that amount of revenue will then build from then going forward. Okay. All right. Um, and so just to clarify, if I live in Beaver Creek, and I work in, say, Fairborn, who has a 2% tax, yes. and I'm, al I'm already paying 2% to Fairborn, if this tax comes in, that will be split in half and Beaver Creek will get one and Fairborn will get one? Is that how it works? No, the way this works is that if you work in a city with a higher tax rate than Beaver Creek, you get full credit for that and won't own Beaver Creek anything more. The way the law reads is that the tax first goes to the city where you work in. And then if your home income tax rate is higher, the remainder comes back home. So to use your scenario, if a, if a Beaver Creek, back up, if a Dayton resident works in Fairborn, Fairborn would, would collect that first 2%. And then because Dayton's rate is 2.5%, Dayton would get that remaining half percent. On the other hand, if a Fairborn resident works in Dayton, Dayton would collect the 2.5% and Fairborn would get nothing because Fairborn's tax rate is lower. So in this case here, a Beaver Creek resident at a 1% tax rate who works in Fairborn, Fairborn would keep all those taxes and the Beaver Creek resident would be granted 100% credit for what they paid to Fairborn and not owe Beaver Creek any more taxes. So as you look at that list of, of all our surrounding communities and see what their property tax rate is, or income tax rate is, excuse me, most of Beaver Creek working residents work in one of those communities. Um, only 25% of Beaver Creek residents work in the city. 
Um, 75% work, work elsewhere. Not, now, 15% of those work on base. So you've got 60% of Beaver Creek residents wouldn't pay anything more. It's, it's an incredible number. By the same token, residents of those cities who work in Beaver Creek, their first 1% of their income tax would stay here and their remaining would go back to their home communities if their communities have a higher tax rate. Sure, and, okay. Yeah, and makes, so- Makes sense. It, it makes sense as far as the legislature has defined it, which is kind of <laughs> crazy, but- Yeah, it is, but, it is strange. It is, but this is the sandbox they've defined us to work in. And so what we're trying to do in our committee is have a fairer way for Beaver Creek residents to fund local services, not very narrowly on the backs of property owners, but, but because 75% of the jobs in Beaver Creek are held by non-residents, those folks are commuting in and out each day, wear and tear on the streets, but only our residents are paying for it. And those residents are all interfacing with our police department every day, but only our residents are paying for it. And it's getting very, very expensive here. Um, right. We'd like to just level the playing field so that everyone is playing the same game, spread it out. And I think it would go a lot better for us. Or right. we think it'd be a lot better for us. Right. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, a lot of information there. Um, let me just stop that sharing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. All right. Well, um, hopefully uh, people can digest all that. And, um, you know, like I said last week, I don't live in Beaver Creek, so it's certainly not my right. decision to make. No. Um, I used to live in Beaver Creek. Um, but I think overall, um, taxing income is a fairer way than to tax um, property because, you know, there's people on fixed income, social security, um, who can't afford the, uh, the continual increases. And, you know, if you're earning the income, then it's obviously easier to pay it. Yes, yeah, so I think with this system here, it's, it's not one or the other, income tax or, or property taxes. 79% uh, of property taxes will still be there because only that 3.4 mil levy is, is, is being rolled, uh, is being expired. Um, right. This will supplement so that we'll have both systems balancing in fairness for those who want income taxes and those who want property taxes. And we're trying to find that happy medium here so that everyone gets something um, but, but no one can get a hundred percent of what they want. That, that would be then a devastatingly unfair system. Right. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you know, the local government fund, the massive cuts that have been made over the last 10 or so years right. that I was talking about in the beginning have impacted all of our cities. And, you know, it's a little bit of a dog eat dog situation, right? I mean, when you, when you see that chart, it's almost like, well, cities are going to be, you know, kind of want to be the highest, have the highest rate. So they're not like beat out by these other cities. Um, so, you know, that's not, that's not um, a helpful situation to have our cities like, you know, fighting over these limited dollars. So um, hopefully the state right. can also um, work on restoring that local government fund some. Yeah, I think you're right. That, that would be a great thing. I know that Beaver Creek lost eight and a half percent of its budget in just one fell swoop that year. And we're talking about $1.2 million occurred every year for the past, uh, what's it been, nine years now, I think it's been. You're talking about $10 million out of the coffers. But in this case, as you see from that chart, Beaver Creek is trying to be the lowest income tax rate possible because that would be great for businesses to come here. Um, again, yeah. you don't you want to be the it's most expensive. That's never good. Um, no. but, but you want to be the lowest cost and best value. And that's what we're trying to promote here. Right, sure. All right, well, thank you, Brian. I appreciate your time and um, good luck with it going forward. Um, campaigning is uh, an art unto itself. So I wish you luck, especially okay, in this thank COVID you. time. <laughs> All that right, makes thanks it more for coming. Difficult to, okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, so there you have it. We've got the pro and the con now um, available for viewing. So um, listen to the presentations and decide for yourself. Um, but like I said, comes back to um, if the state was uh, making good on its taxing of our um, people in Ohio fairly, because the tax, um, Ohio obviously has at the state level, a lot more mechanisms for 
or ability to tax. They've got a corporate income tax. They've got inheritance taxes. They've got these LLC exemptions, um, personal property taxes. They've got a whole um, arsenal of ways to tax rather than a city that's just straight up income tax. So um, yeah, we need a system where everyone's paying their fair share. And these local taxes definitely, and property taxes, put the burden on the working and middle class unfairly. So yeah. All right, well, thank you for listening today. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, next week, we are going to be talking about Medicaid and the recent, well, I say recent, it was in the last few years, um, the scandal that took a whole lot of tax dollars um, out of our coffers and put them into the hands of these middlemen in the Medicare prescription drug um, system. So that will be interesting too. So thank you for tuning in. Enjoy your Friday. It's a beautiful, cool one out, out there. Fall is arriving by the looks. And enjoy your weekend and we'll see you next week. Thank you.